a wonderful school with wonderful children and a wonderful community that supports us. So um, to that effect, thank you so much for coming out tonight. We had some stiff competition with the beautiful weather, so I appreciate you wanting to come and join me for this evening's presentation on four-year college planning. So today I'm giving a presentation that's an encore to the presentation that your children and students received this morning. And this presentation really does kick off the admission season. So at this point, we've given all of our students a presentation that relates to their post-secondary plans. So we had a four-year college presentation, we had a two-year college presentation, and a career and military presentation today. So students were able to select what uh, presentation best fit their plan after high school. And now we're moving into small group presentations and um, work in the computer labs on some of our college planning platforms and software. And then we're going to be moving into individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with all students throughout the college admission process. So thank you all for being here to kind of find out what was shared with your students today so that you can support us at home with what they should be working on. So I asked this of them this morning, and I'll ask it of you as well. What is our stress level in regards to the college admission process? One being, I am cool as a cucumber, this is easy peasy. Is anybody at a one, two, three? Oh, no, okay. Oh, you're, you're cool as a cucumber, I love that, okay. <laughs> you're not the one going, right? There you go. Who is at like a four, five, six? Like, we're a little stressed, but we're feeling okay. Our a handful. Anybody at a seven, eight, nine? It's really feeling a little overwhelming, a little cumbersome. Anyone at a solid ten? Like I'm gonna lose it right now. <laughs> I need some counseling support. Okay. So I would say like eighty percent of our students raised their hand at ten today. They are all very stressed. They're all very stressed, and. It's understandable. It's a very stressful process. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of pressure from a lot of different, you know, pieces of this puzzle. And I wish that I, you know, had an answer for them for how to get into their school of their dreams. Unfortunately, it's not science, this process. It's really an art. And there's a lot of different nuances and subtleties to it that are hard to sometimes figure out. But what I will be able to tell you is what the process is. I can't tell you if your kid's going to get into that dream school because, again, there's so many factors that are outside of your child's control, unfortunately, in this process. But I can tell you how to survive this process, how to get through this process together with them, and they will end up at a school that they're going to be happy at. I can assure you that. It might not be the school that they're thinking of today, but they all will go to school and they all will be okay. And that's what I did tell them today. We will get you there, I promise. So without further ado, we're gonna go through really the nitty gritty details and the nuts and bolts of the process today so that you can start to support them at home. One caveat that I always kind of give out to parents and guardians is that this really has to be their process. They are going to be leaving you shortly, right? And it's hard to think about that they are going to be leaving that nest and they're going to need to be able to advocate for themselves to manage their educational future and career and if they don't get the opportunity to start doing that now, it's gonna be a much more difficult transition to college. So I would really encourage you to let them be in control, to be in the driver's seat of this process, but you are there to facilitate and grab the wheel if they're going off the road, if that makes sense, okay? And I know that's so hard, because we wanna take the wheel with them, but they really need to do this themselves. And it's, the colleges want them to do it for, for themselves as well. I, can, I can't tell you how many times admission representatives tell us Please tell your parents not to be the ones calling us. They, if you have a question, if your child has a question, they should be picking up the phone and calling because it's a ding against them if mom or dad calls to find out that answer, okay? So you really need to make sure that they're handling the process as much as humanly possible. All right, so here we go. And please stop me if you have any questions as we go through the, the process, okay? So first I want to just introduce our school counseling staff here. We have a wonderful staff and we are fully staffed, whereas a lot of schools, you know, arts and, and counseling are the first thing that gets cut, unfortunately, but not here at St. Tasco. We've had a very strong department for a long time. So there's myself, Mrs. Coonan, Ms. McDarmid, and our newest school counselor, Ms. Papazian, and she's actually here tonight joining us. We're really happy to have her join our community. And we also have Mrs. O'Neill. 
So the four first counselors listed handle the academic division and Mrs. O'Neill handles the senior technical division students. So if there's anything that pops up, you absolutely should reach out to any of us. We're happy to help you and help you navigate this process. So we want to make sure that first every student graduates from Tantasco. That's the first step to getting to college. And this is part of our job as school counselors, is to make sure that they're taking all the classes that they need to graduate and meet all those distribution requirements, which are above, and also that they've passed the MCAS exams. So that is something that we are working on with every student, and their senior schedule should be what they need in order to get their diploma, as long as they do well in senior year. So this could be them if they meet the requirements, they're happy, you're happy, life is good, everyone's graduated, that special moment. And if they don't meet those requirements, that's maybe you, maybe it's them, maybe it's everybody, right? You don't wanna be in that boat. So we're working hard to make sure that all of our students are pushing through all the way to June. So typically eight out of 10 Tantasca students are attending uh, post-secondary education, whether that be a technical school, a two-year associate's degree, or a four-year bachelor's degree. Now, the technical certificate programs and the two-year programs for you know, and Sigmund, those processes are much, much easier. You know, really, it's just an application, and you're admitted, and on you go. The four-year process is very, very time-consuming and cumbersome, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. So here's what a typical college application will include. It will include, number one, college admissions testing scores. That could mean SATs, which is that wonderful test you all took on a Saturday many moons ago. It could be SAT subject tests, which are one hour exams in one particular subject, whether it be chemistry, English, math, etc. It could also be the ACT, which is the American College Test and is comparable to the SAT. So every student we told back in you know, January, we said you really need to take one SAT reasoning test in either May or June of your junior year. So I'm hoping all of your children and students have done that. They now need to be thinking about kind of the next test, which is the SATs again. We recommend that students take the test two, no more than three times. And one of those is in junior year, and now the two other remaining tests that they might take are in the fall, in October, November, and December. SAT subject tests are only required of very high tier, highly selective colleges. Most students will not need to worry about the SAT subject tests, but some will. And so it's very important for your student to be looking at the college application and see if those tests are required because there's only so many SAT dates to take them and you don't want to miss out. And if you miss those dates, there's kind of no going back and you can't apply to that school without those tests taken. So there's that testing piece. The second piece of the puzzle is the application. So some colleges have their specific application, Endicott College, for example. They have the Endicott College application. If your student wants to go to Endicott, they go on the website, fill out the application, submit it. There's also something called the Common Application, however. The Common Application is an organization of 900 colleges at this point that all use one application. That's why it's called the common application. So if your student is lucky enough to have 10 schools that they're applying to that are all on the common application, they just have one application to fill out. Granted, it's a long one, the common app is not short, but it's at least one application. If your student unfortunately chose 10 schools that are not on the common application, they have to fill out 10 school-specific applications, okay? The next piece of the puzzle is an essay and possibly supplements. The essay um, is a very important part of the college application piece. As I say to a lot of kids, not to make you feel, you know, like, like not like unique and special, but there are children across this country that have the same GPA, the same rank, and the same transcript as you, and the same SAT scores. The essay is where you become unique. The essay is where you differentiate yourself from everybody else with that same academic profile. Colleges are wanting the essay to be an expression of their voice, an expression of their spirit, what drives them, what gets them up out of bed in the morning. They want it to be memorable. The worst thing that you can do is write a boring essay, and that is the truth. 
I hear kids come in and they say, oh, I want to write about working with children at a camp over the summer. How many of those essays do you think the admission counselors have read over the years? Countless, countless, countless essays. That is not going to be something that stands out to them. On the other hand, if you write about sugar, like maple sugar, um, like gathering maple, sugar, maple syrup, uh, which is one of the essays that uh, the Georgetown rep that I talked with said was her most memorable essay, that stands out. That's something that this person's going to remember. This person talked about walking through the woods in New Hampshire and collecting maple syrup and what that meant to her. Not everybody's writing about that. That's interesting, that's unique. And so that's really what we want our students to focus on, is something that makes them stand out, but also something that really highlights their strengths, their curiosity, their passion, their spirit. Supplements are smaller essays that sometimes are included in the application. So that could be one paragraph on why you think Dartmouth is the best school for you, or what have you done um, to show your independence. They're just little quick questions that are usually about a paragraph response in length. So the essay is really the, the meat of the application because it's usually 600 to 800 words, and then the supplement is usually 150 to 200 words. It's just a little smaller. Not every school will ask for an essay. Not every school will ask for a supplement but they should have an essay in their back pocket ready to go because most colleges at this point do request an essay. The next piece of the puzzle are letters of recommendation. So, you, oh yes sir. How many words on that essay? It depends on the college, but most, okay, we'll yes, the application will tell you, it will say please respond to this prompt in 600 words. Yeah. The next piece of the puzzle is the letters of recommendation. So colleges are looking for usually three letters of recommendation. One is from the school counselor to talk about that student as a whole. We talk about the transcript. We talk about the context with which they have achieved success. We talk about sometimes personal circumstances that may have impacted their ability to do their very best academically. We talk about kind of our personal interactions and anecdotes with them. We're kind of giving that global overview of your student in our letter of recommendation. The teacher letters of recommendation are focusing on who your student is in the classroom. What are they like? Are they raising their hand, offering up great suggestions? Are they kind of quietly sitting back, soaking it in? Are they amazing writers? Have they grown a lot from where they started? That's what the teachers are going to be focusing on. The teachers aren't focusing on extracurriculars, really. They're focusing on who is that student as a learner. Colleges love these letters of recommendation because they really do, again, allow some differentiation between students who have the same academic profile. If you have a teacher who adores your student, they're going to glow about them, and that's going to matter to the admission representative. And so that's why it's really important for your students to pick the right people to ask them to write them a letter of recommendation. School counselors will write one regardless. We will write one for every student on our caseload who needs one. They don't need to ask us. But teachers, they need to pick two teachers who they feel comfortable asking and who they feel know them well and can write about them well. Sometimes I have students ask me, well, I want to ask you know, four people, and then I want to ask my coach, and I want to ask my pastor. The colleges have no time for any of that. They want as many, as few letters as possible, to be quite honest, because they're reading thousands of applications. So when they say one letter of recommendation or two letters of recommendation, they mean it. Don't think that more is better. More will just irritate them. And we don't want to irritate the admission reps because they're the ones making this decision. The last piece is the high school transcript and the schedule of courses. So we send out with our letter of recommendation the transcript, which is all the classes your student has taken, the grades they've received, and at what level they took that class at. We also send them the schedule for senior year. We talk a lot to our students during course selection about being rigorous all the way to the end. And that's true. We do not, and the college admission reps do not, want to see students dropping off and taking, quote, an easy senior year. Those days are gone, unfortunately, and students have to keep their foot on the gas all the way to June and be rigorous all the way to June. So now that we kind of understand the five main components of the application, let's talk about more in detail. So college admissions, as we've talked about a little bit, you have 
Hopefully, your student has registered and taken one SAT already in May or June. They should be signed up for October, November, or December, depending on when their first application deadline is. There's those three different types of tests, so the SAT reasoning, that's that big three and a half hour exam. It has a writing portion that is optional. I would recommend that every student take the SAT at least once with the writing component because there are some schools that will only accept the SAT with writing. And if you haven't done it with writing, you have to take the SAT all over again with the writing to be able to submit to that school and apply. And if you don't have it with writing, you can't apply to that college and you don't want to be in that situation. This subject test, as I said before, those one hour exams in one subject, you should be thinking about if a student's going into engineering or going into neuroscience or biochemical, there might be some subject tests that kind of go along with that. And those are only one hour in length, so you can take three of them on one SAT date. So you can either take the SAT reasoning, which is the big three hour test, or you can take up to three one hour subject tests on, this, on that day. Okay. The last is the ACT. This is a standardized college exam, entrance exam, that was created in Iowa. And that's why no one out here really knows it or does a lot with it. Uh, we used to offer the ACT, but we never really had a great enrollment, and so we dropped it a few years ago because the SATs are from New Jersey. That's why we all know the SAT. If you went to Iowa, everybody would be taking the ACT. Now, there is sometimes a reason for a kid to take an ACT. It's a different format of a test. It's less about memorization and more about did you pay attention in your classes and do well in terms of the format. It's not trying to you know, trick you like sometimes the SATs do. There also is a science component. So if your student is really strong in sciences, they can show their strength on the SAT in this area. The ACT also has an optional writing portion, which again, your student should probably take. I will be honest, usually SAT scores and ACT scores they're right about the same. I rarely see a student who's blown it away on the ACTs, but bombed the SATs. It's usually comparable in terms of scores. However, sometimes you do see a little bit of a jump on one test. So if your student's not a great tester, and you wanna give them the opportunity to try the ACTs, you absolutely can do that. One thing to note, SATs again should be taken no more than three times. Please don't subject your poor student to four times, five times. It's just not emotionally good for those poor souls. It's a stressful event. Three times, you're gonna get a good score. And usually, by the second time you take it, your score will jump 100 points just because you've taken the test once before and you're a little familiar with it. So we do see that test bump that happens between the first and the second time the student takes it. Also, there's a lot of free resources. Uh, Khan Academy online partnered with the College Board. They provide free practice tests, free exams, free tutorials. It's amazing. And we found, and d data has found, that 10 hours on Khan Academy results in about a 100 point jump on the SATs as well. So that's another thing that you can tell your students to do before they can go out and have fun on the weekends. You say, did you do your hour on Khan Academy? They're gonna hate me for suggesting that, but. So. Here's some upcoming test dates and registration dates. So SAT reasoning and subject tests. Again, you can take the reasoning test or three subject tests. The first exam is October 5th and the late registration period is still open. You have to pay a late fee now because your student missed the regular testing deadline and we did, we, we sent out some reminders and hopefully everybody signed up, but if they didn't, September 24th, you can still register. November 2nd and then December 7th. You need to do all your registering on the College Board website and you have to pay with a credit card. If your student is on free and reduced lunch, they can come and see me for a fee waiver and that will waive the cost of the exam for them. The ACTs, again, are not offered here. They're offered in Worcester, in Munson, Springfield. You have to drive a little bit, but you could take those on either October 26th or December 14th. Again, you're gonna register online at actstudent.org. Now, after you take all the exams, the colleges want these scores most often. And you have to, of course, because it's College Board, pay to have your scores sent to every school. It's $12 per school. 
So please be aware that that cost is going to you know, be a factor in all the application costs. I mean, it, it definitely adds up if you're applying to a handful of schools. So be aware that the college board will charge you $12 per school, but they will need those scores, the colleges, to accept your student. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. If your student is not a great tester, a lot of schools are now shifting to this test optional model where they do not consider test scores, they don't want your test scores, they really think it's more about your student and the transcript and who they are, their essay, those kind of things. So if you want to look at those schools, it's on the website fairtest.org, so it's www.fairtest.org, and they have a list of all of the different schools that are test optional now and do not require SATs or ACTs. And they actually have a ton of top tier, very highly selective colleges that do not need test scores anymore, which is a nice shift, I think, away from this very stressful Saturday experience. Any questions on testing before I move on? Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. She asks, if you're applying to a school in you know, Iowa or Nebraska, let's say, um, do you have to take the ACTs or will the AC SATs work? The SAT and the ACT are comparable and I have not found a school yet that will not accept either one. So you are all set. That's a great question. Any other testing questions? Okay. So that's the first piece of the test. You know, sign up for the SATs and practice for the SATs. That's step one. In the meantime, while you're waiting for the test to happen, there's some things that we'd like the students to be doing. The first thing is researching colleges and creating a final list of colleges. How many of you took your lovely ones to college visits this summer? Was it a good experience, stressful, exciting, interesting? How'd you guys do? Did okay? Did you want to go back to college yourselves? I always feel like, like can I go with you? Colleges or the tours? Or, yeah. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's nice to go on those tours and to go visit those schools because I think a lot can be figured out pretty quickly for students on what they want or what they don't want in a campus. Even if that student hates that school, it might give them some insight into what they don't like about it and then that helps narrow down their college list going forward. So going out and visiting is absolutely the best way to figure out if this school is the right fit for your student. Those trips can be a little hairy-nary, but they're, they're worth it in the end for sure. In addition to going obviously on the college visits and checking out the schools, there's a lot of ways to do it from the comfort of your own home, just explore those colleges. So we have Navions, which we have used now for a very long time, and it is our college and career platform. And we have something in Navions called Supermatch. This is a search engine which allows students to put in criteria that's important to them, and it spits out all of the colleges that meet that criteria. This is a great place to at least start because there's so many schools out there, particularly in New England. I mean, we are blessed with so many different colleges right down the road. It's overwhelming. Kids don't know where to start. So if they can start at least by putting in criteria that's important to them, and that could be a major, that could be location. You know, I only want to be in Massachusetts, or I only want to be in, you know, Arizona. It could be, <coughs> I don't want to be in the city. I know I don't want to be in the city. I want to be in the country. So I'm going to narrow down the schools that way. Or it could be I want a school of 40,000 or more. Every student has kind of different ideas as to what's important to them. And so as they start to put all this criteria in, it will help narrow it down. And then from that list, they can start checking out the websites, going to the tours, checking, you know, going to, to you know, alumni events or whatever it might be to just get a feel for things. Another way that's a great way to check out schools and to get more information in colleges after they've done this like super match search, so to speak, is to meet with our college representatives that visit here at Tantasqua from all of these different colleges. So we have usually around 65 to 70 college representatives come every year to Tantasqua to meet with your senior students in the school counseling department office. This is a fantastic way for your student to learn more about that college, to learn more about who they're looking for, what new initiatives they have, why they should think about that college and put that college on their list. But also, it's a great way for the admission rep to fall in love with your student and really want to root for them. 
Now, the trick of this all is, is that the person that they're sending to our school is usually the reader. And that's the person who is responsible for going through every application from Tantasqua and making the decision, yes or no. So this is the person that is really responsible for your student's fate at that school. And it's worth it to have your student make the opportunity to have a good impression on this student, or on this representative. A little quick story, I had a student who absolutely fell in love with this college. It was his dream college. He wanted to go there since the beginning of time. And very honestly, it was a reach school for him. It was above where he was at. And I was a little concerned. I was like, okay, you know, let's try to think about a lot of different options. Let's not put all of our eggs in this one basket. But he was, had, he was a stubborn, persevering young man, and that was where he was going to go. He came to the college representative visit, met with the admission rep. They formed such a nice connection. They started emailing back and forth. They formed this really nice bond, and he got into that school. And I, I really am convinced that it was that personal relationship he had crafted with the admission rep that made the difference for him. Because he was a wonderful kid and a great kid, but he was below their typical criteria, just in all honesty. But that made the difference, that personal connection. Because when they read his essay, when they looked at his transcript, they could picture his face, picture those nice conversations they had with him, and that made the difference. So I really encourage all of your seniors today to, to take advantage of those meetings and come down and talk with those representatives. Do you have a question? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I, on the next page, I have a screenshot of where it shows up in Naviance. But it all happens in Naviance, which is great. So the students can log right in, sign up electronically in Naviance, and then head right down to the meeting at the, at the time. So I know we have UMass Amherst, we have Endicott, we usually have Southern New Hampshire, we have UConn. Every year it's a, it's a little bit different here and there. Um, some kind of schools you've never heard of, like Albertus Magnus, maybe St. Anne's up in Manchester. Um, again, usually like 70 schools, which is great. Um, and so I'll show you that in just a second. The other thing that we want your student to do, in addition to researching colleges and starting to put together a list of schools, is to match their Naviance account with ConNAP. So what this means is we use Naviance to send all of our documentation to schools, regardless if that student is applying through the Endicott application or the Common application. It doesn't matter. We send everything through Naviance. But we need the common application platform to talk with the Naviance platform so we can send all of those materials for your student. And so it's important that your student matches their common application account with their Naviance account so that we can send materials for them to the common app schools. And I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like in Naviance. It's a very quick click of a button, but it is an important piece of the puzzle. The other thing we need your students to do are complete some surveys for their teacher letters of recommendation. So you've asked, let's say, Mr. Jones, he is the math teacher. He says, yes, I'd be happy to write your letter of recommendation. Now it's that student's responsibility to go into Naviance and fill out a survey. It asks them, what was your biggest accomplishment in my class? What was your biggest challenge? Uh, what did you, you know, what was your personal growth in my class? It just asks them some kind of pointed questions about their experience with that teacher. And that survey information is used by the teacher to write their letter of recommendation. So it's really a nice thing that you're doing for your teacher who's helping you out and writing a nice letter for you. It just gives them that extra bit of information that they're going to need to craft a really nice letter for your student. So again, once they ask that teacher in person, yes, Mr. Jones will write your letter, then they go into Naviance and they're filling out the surveys. Also, there's surveys for us, the school counselors. We have four different surveys because we're kind of focusing on that whole student, right? So we have an autobiography survey, which asks them a lot of questions about, you know, what was the hardest thing you've, you know, had in your life and where did, you know, how do you work? Do you, it just asks them a lot about different things with family and home and work and extracurriculars and school, trying to get us really inside their mind and, and so we can write a really thoughtful and well-crafted letter of recommendation for them. We also ask them to do an extracurricular survey and a, or a resume, let us know all the different activities they've done so we can include those in their letter. Um, if they have any personal circumstances, which we should you know, consider mentioning, we'll ask them that they put that in as well. And then we have a parent guardian survey for you. You guys know your students best, and oftentimes you guys are 
so happy to brag about them and tell us wonderful things about your student that they didn't even think about or they did fail to mention to us. So we often learn a ton from parents and guardians through these surveys. Maybe they're taking care of grandma every day at home when they get home and we had no idea. That stuff matters, that's important, and we want to talk about that in the letter. So these are all the different things in Naviance that your student really should be working on now as we begin this process. So again, they're researching the schools, they're creating their final list of schools with our help, with your help. They are matching their account with Common App, if they have Common App schools. They're finishing up those surveys for teachers and for counselors. Any questions? Yeah? How would these parents get to that survey if you get it? So your student has to log in and bring you to the survey, and you can sit and type, and then they'll save it. Yeah. Do you need one in one in both areas? Just one is fine. Yep, one is totally fine. So here's what the screen looks like. I put some screenshots in of Navion so you can get a sense of where everything is. So here is Supermatch. Uh, there's four different tabs at the top, home, colleges, career, about me and my planner. And under the colleges tab is really where a lot of things live in this presentation. Under the top here it says find your fit and it says Supermatch. And that's where to go to start that search engine and put in that criteria. You can also see there's scattergrams, there's a college match, there's lots of college compare. There's a lot of different tools that you can use in there to look at two different schools that you're interested in, how do they stack up to each other. Um, scattergrams will give you a sense of what past graduates were accepted for, to that school. Um, so it gives you kind of a sense of our track record with those schools. A lot of really good information. So again, with Supermatch, if you clicked on Supermatch, this is the next screen that you would see, and you would see Choose Fit Criteria. So there's location, academics, admission, diversity, institution characteristics, cost, student life, athletics, and resources. And basically, it's asking you and your student to put things into two columns. The first column is the must-haves. These are things your student absolutely has to have at a college to be happy and successful. The second column is nice to have. It's something that's important, but maybe not critical for your student. So, at the top, you're probably thinking about location. That's usually a great criteria to put in first because it narrows things down quite quickly. If your student knows they don't want to leave New England, that narrows it down fast. The other thing that you can put in that kind of narrows things down quickly under academics would be a major. If your student wants to major in art history, that's going to narrow it down, for example. They also have admission. This is how selective is that college? Is your student only interested in the top tier, most selective schools that have like 3% acceptance rates? Or are they looking for schools that really accept 80 to 90% of their student who apply? So again, you're thinking about what are the must-haves, what are the nice-to-haves, and you're putting all those criteria into the system. And so here's what can get spit out. So for example, I did a little fake search here. I chose Ohio. I chose, I wanted to be in Ohio. Campus surroundings, I picked um, in like a city, like a city suburb. And acceptance rate, I picked um, kind of mid-range. Because I was thinking, all right, I could probably get into some of those schools. And so here's what gets spit back to you. It showed me that I could go to Youngstown State University. <clears throat> Lake Erie College, Ashland University, the University of Toledo, it started giving me options. And it also tells you the fit score. This is how much of that criteria matches that school. All of those top three schools had 90, or excuse me, had 100% fit. So everything I asked for, that school delivered on. So it was in the right location, it had the right major, it was the right campus location. University of Toledo was only 90%. And you're thinking, well, what, what didn't it have? You can click on the little Y button and it'll tell you what criteria it did not quite meet, okay? The next column here, it tells you the academic match. It tells you the average GPA, the average SAT score, average ACT scores. So your student can look at themselves and say, okay, where do I fit compared to the typical student who gets in? They have the cost. Just don't look at that column, you'll cry. Um, and then they also have pick what to show. You can pick different categories of things that you want highlighted when you're looking at all of these schools. 
Okay? So this is a great way to begin because at least it starts to narrow down the thousands of schools out there so it's something more manageable for you and your student to navigate. Down here at the bottom, there's three little, little box, like tabs, I guess. So the first one is pinned. If you like a school, if you want to know more about a school, you pin the school. It's like, kind of like saving it, right? If you are really thinking about that school, you're going to put it under your colleges and thinking about list. And if you know for certain you're going to apply to that school, you move it to the applying to list. Okay? So they have kind of like a rough draft list, a final draft list. Pinning is just the exploring piece of it. You can compare pinned schools together. This is really how to kind of begin the process. In addition to Supermatch, it's not the only search engine out there. Of course, there's a ton out there. There's the College Board. Uh, they have a great search engine on collegeboard.org. It's called Big Future. And then also Mass CIS. This is a um, state program, and it's actually fantastic. They have a lot of really good resources at Mass CIS as well. In addition to these search engine platforms, you can ask, of course, your school counselor to help you. We have College View Books. Did you guys use College View Books when you were applying to school? I did. Like, you find the book and you open it up. No one looks at those anymore. It's all online for the, for the new generation, but we do have those View Books in the counseling office. In your library, a lot of good information there. The websites, of course, are great. Local college fairs. Um, in my summer letter, I sent out to you five college fairs that are upcoming and local to the area. There's one at Worcester State coming up in the next uh, two weeks. So again, great opportunities to go check out like 100 schools all at once for a few hours. Okay, so that's another great way to look for some schools. And then again, of course, the admission rep visits, which we talked about before. Yes? And I believe it's September 23rd, don't quote me on that, but I, it, I know, I put it in my summer letter, which is on the school counseling webpage. You all got to connect at about that letter in the summer, and it's linked there, and it has all four of the um, fairs that are closest to our location. I listed them with where to go, what time, they're all listed right there. Okay. Did you have a question? I didn't get one. I know you I didn't get the connect then message? No. Nope, okay. Right. So we'll, if... Let me come up at the end and I'll make sure that we have your, your phone number right, because okay. <laughs> that would be good. The other thing to think about um, in college kind of exploration are college visits and interviews. So of course we, we want our students to go in, on the campus tours, on the information sessions. There's something called demonstrated interest and the admission office checks off how many times you come to their campus. So if you come to their campus a lot, that shows that you're very interested. If you apply and say, you're my number one school, and they look back and they've never seen that you've come to visit, it doesn't bode well for your students. So you might want to consider making the road trip to get out to that college and really showing that you are interested. Even if you can go to a local event here, you know, sometimes they have alumni hosting local events, so you don't have to like fly to you know, California or something. Uh, and they understand that if you're far away, it's probably not possible. But even calling the admission office, that counts as demonstrated interest. So again, have your students be that person reaching out to those admission offices, because it does matter. Also, you can have an interview. Um, some students, I feel, did beautifully in their interviews because I just know the type of kid they are, I know how they talk with adults, their comfort level, and that made the difference with them getting into some top tier schools. So we have a bunch of different interview resources we can give to your student. Um, we can do mock interviews with your student and get them comfortable for things. What I always say is if you're going to go on some interviews and some of the top tier schools will want interviews, don't pick your favorite school as your first interview. Like, give it a little bit of time and go to some other schools first, get your flow, get your momentum, and then interview at your, your top school. Any questions on any of the college research and planning? Okay. Oh, yes. I just, I mean, it's MassCIS, M A S S C I S dot org. Just go to dot org and it'll kind of bring you to all the different features that they have. Oh. Okay. So you asked about where do we find the college rep visits, here they are. So under that colleges tab where everything else was, down at the bottom you see college visits, it will give you the date, the time, the college, and that student is going to click on that college, sign up, show the, the pass to the teacher, say I signed up for this, head down and they meet. 
easy as pie. Okay. All right. So you've been researching schools. They've been pinning school lists in Naviance. As we talked about, they're doing the research first. Then they're moving that school to the colleges and thinking about list. That's kind of their rough draft. They're, they're considering it. They're narrowing it down. And then finally, the colleges I'm applying to is the final list of where that student is planning to apply. This list has to be accurate in Naviance because it is how we and the teachers submit all the documents and information. If there's a school on here that they're really not applying to, we're going to send some stuff to them because it, it's going to look like we should. So make sure that as your students kind of working through this process, they're using the colleges I'm thinking about as their rough draft list. And then they're really only moving them to the colleges I'm applying to list when they're sure, 100% sure they're going to apply to that school. And speaking of the college list, your student should have approximately 8 to 10 schools. I think 10 is obviously, honestly a bit too much. I think 8 is a very nice number. Um, don't do 15 schools, don't do 12, it's, it's just too much. It's too much to navigate, it's too much to manage for a lot of students. It's a lot of money as well. If you do it right, you can hit everything you want out of the list with eight to 10 schools. You should have some reach schools. Your students should have some reach schools on their list. Schools that they fall below the typical criteria of, of their applicants and their accepted students, but you know, hey, they're excited about it, they're passionate about it. Go out there and give it a shot. They could be the kid who gets in. You know, you never do know. There also should be some possible and target schools. Those are schools that, here's the school's criteria for a typical student, here's your student. Right on track. We feel like they're a really good shot to get into that college. They should also have some safety schools. Safety schools are where your student is up here and the typical applicant is down here. We know they're gonna get in, it's a shoe in Students sometimes say, well, wh why do I need a safety school? I'm not going to go there. If they offer you a full ride, you might, right? So sometimes when you are way above the typical applicant, they want you. They want to recruit you. They want to bring up their stats by having you attend their college. And so if you get a fabulous financial package from that college, maybe it looks a little bit more attractive at that point. So I always suggest to have a variety of different types of schools on there. Also, you should have some public and private options. I believe that every student should have at least one state school on their list. That could be UMass, Amherst, Boston, Dartmouth, or Lowell, or it could be any of the state universities, Westfield, Worcester, Fitchburg, Framingham, etc. The reason is those are financially affordable colleges, they love our students, and they're fantastic. I mean, UMass Amherst is, is an incredible school now. It is a flagship school that students from all across the world want to attend. It's a fantastic research school. And not to, and I said this to the students, I don't want to take the wind out of anyone's sails, but it is very hard now to get into UMass Amherst. The average GPA is around a 3.76, 3.8. That's that's almost an A average. Okay, so it's a very different world than a zoo mass that I had when I was, you know, that's what I think of zoo mass, zoo mass. So it's very different now. And it's a fantastic school. They love our students. And I will tell you, though, that we had a student this year who got into UMass Amherst. He only had like a 3.4 GPA, but it's because he took a lot of AP classes. Um, that was the difference, because at UMass, the first thing they do is they look at your transcript, they add up how many APs you've taken, and that factors into their decision quite heavily. So students who have challenged themselves throughout high school do get rewarded in these situations with state schools often. Okay? So if your student doesn't really know, is this school a reach, is this a possible, that's also what we do with them in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. We talk with them, we look at their statistics, we look at their transcript, and we kind of work together to figure out, okay, this is a reach, this is a safety, this is a possible. Any questions on the college list before we keep moving? Okay. Again, public schools, they are generally less expensive to attend, so it is nice to have those on your students' list, along with all of the private universities that they might like as well, like Holy Cross, Assumption, Western New England, etc. So to create your college list in Naviance, again, you're up here in the Colleges tab. And here under Apply to Colleges, it's Colleges I'm Applying to, right here. Okay, so it's quite easy. Everything is easy to find. We 
we talked about matching the common app and Navion's before, right? Those platforms have to talk to each other. This is something that I always want to tell the parents about as well, and it's the FERPA waiver, okay? So FERPA stands for Family Education Rights Privacy Act, and it is all about protecting your students' confidential information. And basically, the FERPA waiver says that you allow the school, which is us, Tantasqua, to send information about your student to colleges with their permission, okay? So nothing can be sent out to the Common App schools without the FERPA waiver being signed. Now, students can decide to waive their right to see all of their documents that we send for them or not waive their right to see all those documents. And this often creates a lot of confusion, so I just want to go through it for a second with everybody. So again, you're on the Common App, you're filling out all of your information, you're going to hit something called the FERPA agreement. And you have to answer a question. It says, do you waive your right to have access to all of the documents that were sent on your behalf from your high school, essentially? So basically, this is your letters of recommendation. That's really the most confidential thing. We don't allow students to see any of the letters. So a student who says yes will never be able to see the letters of recommendation that were written on their behalf. A student who says no, I do not agree to that waiver, they will be able, if the college keeps them, able to access those letters of recommendation once they head off to that college. They can march down to the admission office and say, I'd like to see my letters of recommendation that were sent here. What do you think the colleges want your student to do? Waive their right or not waive their right? Waive their right. Why do you think they want them to waive their right and not see any of the documents sent on their behalf? I want to give a more accurate description of the student. That's exactly right. They feel like if a teacher and a counselor can write unencumbered and know that whatever they write is confidential, it's going to be a more honest letter with integrity. Now remember, if your student is asked a teacher to write them a letter, is that teacher who says yes, is they going to write bad things about your student? They just won't. Like No one is writing bad things or, or not nice things about your student. Everything that we put in letters of recommendation is positive. Even if there is a a negative, we're trying to twist it into a positive and make it, you know, a strength or a growing point. So there really is nothing that they would need to see or worry about with the letters of recommendation. But the colleges do encourage students to waive their right and to not see any of the things that are sent on their behalf. Kids can do what they want. At the end of the day, it's their decision. But I will tell you that the colleges, it's a little bit of a, you know, blip, it's a little bit of a red flag if they don't waive their right sometimes. For an admission gap. I did. I told them this today. So it, it, they, are they clicking based on the recommendation? No or yes? So They're clicking. Yes, I waive my right. Yes, I do not. Right. I will not see anything. <laughs> yep. Yes, I waive my right. Okay. And so that's part of the task of matching the two accounts. You can't match your Common App account with Naviance until you've done the verbal waiver and have this conversation with your student, and they answer yes or no. Okay. And this is what it looks like when you go to Navi. So you're on Common App, you've signed the FERPA waiver, then you hop back onto Navi and it says, it looks like you're not currently able to apply to Common App schools. Match your Common App account to Navi to get started. You click on this button, you're matched. It's easy. Okay, but you have to do the FERPA waiver first. That's that critical part in the Common App side of things. Okay? Any questions on this? This can be a little tricky until the kids actually get in there and do it themselves. Yep, that's what we're doing. On, I'm doing mine on Friday. So all of my students and I are meeting in the computer lab on computers. We're all doing a lot of this stuff together. Are they doing it with the counselors? Yes, every counselor is taking all the small groups in other cases. So, in addition, in Naviance, there's something else that the students need to do for teacher recommendation requests. So they've asked them in person, that teacher has said yes. They need to request the letter formally in Naviance, okay, before they can fill out the survey for that teacher. 
And again, we're talking, to we're talking to students about asking teachers they had last year as a junior, or they've had multiple times, or they teach in a major that they plan to go into, like a nursing major would want to ask a science and math teacher. You're trying to think kind of strategically about what person you're asking to write that letter. But you have to go into Naviance and request it first. And this is another one of those tasks we're going to do with them in groups on Friday. So this is what it kind of looks like. They're requesting teacher recommendations under Apply to Colleges. They're going to click on Letters of Recommendation. And then they click Add a Request. There's a drop down with all the teachers. They pick their teacher. They click a button. It's done. It's really simple stuff. And again, we're just going to be working with them all in groups, hands on in the lab, so that they can get through some of these tasks together with us. Okay. And again, we've talked about those surveys before. Um, this is another thing that they could get started on over the weekend. I mean, we're going to meet with them all in groups and kind of get them off and running. And then over the weekend, if they could start working on their surveys for us, that's really, really helpful because they do take some time and we want to write good letters for them. And if they give us good survey information, we can really write good letters. Excuse me? Yes. Does it, does it have to be? I mean, could they be one teacher and one say, I think my son has a, a boss that consistent with what he wants to major in. So it seems like it would be a good recommendation. Colleges really want teachers. They really want the people who are seeing them in the classroom as a learner, um, as opposed to coaches or bosses or supervisors. Um, sometimes you may find a college that's willing to take an outside letter, uh, but it's probably not in place of a teacher letter. It might be in addition to a teacher letter. So again, here's what it looks like in Navion. So under About Me, that's where they're going to find all the surveys that they need and their resume over here. Everything is, is kind of easily found on Navion once you start to look. So now it's the time to get organized. So a student, let's say, has signed up for the SATs, figured out, done some exploration where they want to apply. They're starting to fill out all their surveys. They're starting to match their Common App account. Now they need to really know, what does each school require of me? Because every single school is different. There, I, if you ask me, well, what is this college? I mean, every single school has a totally different application list. So what I told students today is an Excel spreadsheet is a great, great helpful tool in this process. What they can do is put down the name of the school, and then they can start listing all this information. Is it a common app school or not? What's the deadline? What subject tests are needed? Do they have an essay? What's the prompt of the essay? How many letters do they need? School forms, a supplement, and on and on. It's a really, really nice way to quickly figure out what you need for each school. It also will help you identify, okay, do I need to sign up for the SAT subject test because I have three schools who need it? Or, hey, these three essay prompts are kind of the same. I could probably write one essay and send them to all three schools. It's, again, a nice way to start to organize your mind and figure out what that student needs to do critically to apply to all of those different colleges. The other thing I would add to this spreadsheet is financial aid deadline, because every school has a different financial aid deadline, and you don't want to miss those or you get no money. Colleges will not accept it late. What is the class of deadline? There, so there's not a a firm deadline on it, um, there's a firm beginning point for the FAFSA, which we'll talk about in just a second. So this completing and submitting documents, so again, you've created your Excel spreadsheet, you kind of know where you're applying, now you're doing the work, you're writing the essays, you're writing the supplements, you're fill, filling out the compound or the school-specific application, you're submitting those applications, you're sending your SAT scores, okay? This is all the nitty-gritty work that you have to do. And just to note, there is something called SAT score choice, which you can decide what scores you send for the SATs. You could say, I want my math score from May, I want my English score from October. You can kind of cherry pick your top scores and send them to the college. So that is possible to do through score choice. The counselor helps with the entire process. Obviously, we're here to help them in any way that they need it, but really, so much of this is their responsibility. They have to be the ones visiting the schools and researching those schools. They have to finalize that list and decide where they want to apply. They have to talk with their teachers and coordinate those recommendations. They have to complete the applications and they have to send their SAT scores. 
All of those things happen by them only, really. And we're here to facilitate all the other pieces, writing their letters of recommendation, sending their transcripts, sending their schedule, helping them along the way with all of this process. So again, we want them in the driver's seat, but we're here for them to help them get through it because it is a lot, absolutely. You had a question. So with the SATs, if your student takes it two or three times, does the school want to see all of them because maybe see an improvement? I mean, you went to so many schools, yep. a lot of them just said, send it all. That's, exa care. that's exactly what I've heard from most admission counselors, yeah. that they don't even care about score choice, really. They just want you to send up, uh, them all, and they'll just pick the best scores anyway. Right? They're not going to, you know, it's not going to weigh against your child. If they see a low score, they're going to pick the highest they can. Because the thing is, they're, they're people. They're rooting for your kid, too. They're not trying to get anybody, you know, to a gotcha moment on SATs. Yes? Um, College board charges $12 for each test that you send, or just per student per school? Per student per school. Yeah, per student per school. So financial aid, that's a hot topic. So the FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid, and you complete it once for all the schools. And it starts and it opens up October 1st. So that's when you can start to submit all of your tax data. They have this retrieval service now where you can put in um, information and it will kind of take all your tax documents from previous years and kind of import them into the system. So it makes it a little easier for you now. They didn't have that a few years ago. But what you can do, so you have to wait till October 1st to start actually doing the FAFSA, but on right now you can apply for something called the FSA ID. This is your unique PIN. Your student will have their own unique PIN in FAFSA. So you can go online and create those IDs today if you wanted to, and then you do need to wait a few weeks until October 1st when you can actually start working on the FAFSA itself. Yes? What if you already have a student in college and you already have a FAFSA? It's unique to, to each student and each process. So I believe that you have to have another FSA ID for yourself for this student to tie with this student. Any other questions? Okay. So the FAFSA is a bear, um, and it is what's required for most colleges for financial aid. Some colleges also have their own college-specific financial aid forms. There's something called the CSS profile, which a lot of private universities use as an additional um, document, an additional uh, financial aid document. So you have to be aware of those deadlines as well and what they require. Is it just the FAFSA? Is it a CSS profile? Is it the Endicott financial aid application? Every school, again, is a little bit different. So you need to just be very on top of it and not miss any deadlines because you do not want to miss the financial aid deadlines. That's a critical one for sure. And those are all on the college websites? They'll all be on their college websites, yes. And they will tell you exactly when everything is due. Sometimes you might have um, certain majors that are due, you know, earlier than other times. Again, everything is very college specific. We have scholarships for your students, um, and in Naviance is how we disseminate the information about those scholarships. So just today I got a phone call about a scholarship, and so we're going to be blasting it out through Naviance for all the seniors. If they're interested and they meet the criteria, they can apply to it. Um, Again, it just pays to kind of be proactive with this. If your student is kind of looking at those emails and making sure that anything they are eligible for they apply to, you know, they might have a shot of getting some, some money, which is great. So we have a filing cabinet in the counseling office which, with some scholarship applications. And again, also in Naviance, there's a whole bunch listed electronically that they can complete that way. If you've all been to class night, um, that's in May when students walk across the stage, they get awards, they get scholarships. That's a fan fantastic night. And that local scholarship process, which is all of the scholarships for class night, begins in February. So the week before February vacation, we meet with your students, we give them all of the applications, and they have all of February break to do all of the applications and turn them in and hopefully get some money on class night. We do have a financial aid presentation coming up on October 17th. Uh, MIFA, which is the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, they're coming for their yearly presentation. And it's at 6 p.m. in the auditorium here. And they talk all about the FAFSA, the CSS profile, um, cost of attendance, estimated financial need. There's all these different formulas. You should be there. It's, it's an informative night, and it really will help you get your head around the complex world of, of college financing.
So here's what your students should be doing at this point. So we are setting up right now small group meetings and then individual meetings. They should be thinking about finishing up those surveys, asking those teachers for letters of recommendation, doing the work in Naviance, and then working on that college list. Um, all application materials for colleges with due dates of January 15th or sooner are due to us by December 1st at the latest. This is because we had a sole one year put a, like a due tomorrow application request the day before Christmas vacation and the counselor was gone and that kid didn't apply to that school because we didn't get it until January. So we just want to make sure that we're handling everything in a timely fashion and we're not getting surprised, you know, right before we walk out the door for the holidays. It depends on, this, on the counselor. So each of us are going to work with that student and say, what is your earliest deadline? I'm sorry, what? Oh, good, okay. I'm happy to. Um, so I'm going to be working with that student and saying, okay, when is your earliest deadline? And then she, she or he, P and I, will um, put together a timeline. So this will be when our first meeting is. This is when our second meeting is. Here's when this is due for me. We'll put it all together so that he's very clear on what he needs to do and when. Okay. So some upcoming events for you and for your students. Uh, the College Admission Rep Panel. This is my favorite night of the year. It's Tuesday, October 1st at 6 p.m. This is the seventh year we've done it. We have UConn, Smith, Clark, and Westfield State coming to talk to us. And they send their most experienced and passionate um, admission reps. And they're gonna talk to us about the college process. As I said before, it's an art, it's not a science. And so they have a lot of really good on the ground information that they can share with families about how to apply, what not to do, what to do. Even if your student has no interest in applying to those four specific schools, it's helpful for every school, for every student who's applying in this process. So I really encourage all of you to be there on October 1st. Then we have an essay writing workshop for the students only, and that's after school on Wednesday the 9th from 2.15 to 3.15 in the library. The English and School Counseling Departments have partnered now for five years to do this presentation. I start out and I talk about the do's and don'ts of the essay, and then we all split into groups based on how far they are in their essay, and we work together with English and counseling staff to kind of help students along on the process. So sometimes students come with totally done essays and they're just sharing it out to students who are also done and we're kind of talking about them. Sometimes students walk in the door, I, what do I write about? I have no idea. That's okay. It doesn't matter where they are in the process. We will help them wherever they're at. And it's a great afternoon. And then again, that Massachusetts financing, um, financial aid presentation is on the 17th. Also, there's a class of 2020 Google Classroom. Uh, this will allow your student to stay updated on college rep visits, on SAT registration deadlines, college and career updates, scholarships, etc. So all of them um, were given the code today. I can't give it out to families because we can't have families on the Google Classroom, like parents on the Google Classroom. It's really only for students um, because there's voting that takes place through stu student council on this. So we can't have like, you know, Mrs. Jones voting for Tommy to be president or something of Stuco. So. But, but it, I did give them all the code today, and I hope that everyone will sign up and uh, follow us so that they can get some announcements and some information as we go through the process. So again, I know your stress levels are at 10. I'm hoping they're not at like 11 now, but they might be, and I apologize in advance. I know this is a really overwhelming process, but as I said to your student, they will all get through this, you will all get through this, we will all make it to the other side, and they will find a place where they're happy and fulfilled by the end of the day. And they'll have a place to go after they graduate, for sure. They will not be in your basement, I promise. <laughs> Any questions or concerns? Anything that popped up? Yes. Uh, you can do it now, that'd be great. The weekend? No, nope, you're going to have to have your student log into their account and kind of open it up and sit you down and you'll type. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. Our, how, what's our stress level, should I ask? Can I ask? Worse? Some people are worse? Okay. That's not good. Sorry. But you have a plan. Okay. I like that positive, I like that positive attitude, Mr. Warren. That's good. Um, 
Again, you will make it through this. I really do promise this is my 11th year doing this. Every kid will make it. Every parent will make it. We'll all be okay together. If you need anything, I'm here. Even if I'm not your student's counselor, I'm happy to talk with you at any time. And I'll be up at the front to answer any questions you might have, okay? Yes? Talk to their counselor sooner than later because there might be a way to adjust their schedule. Well, they And again, that's, I know, there, there's a lot of schools out there, right, that do it. For nursing, I think, is the most specific. Right. It's usually bio, AP bio, chemistry, anatomy. Physics is kind of an outlier course, yeah. Right, so there's no way of getting around that? You'd have to talk to their admissions office and see if they would be willing. Well, I would make a call. I would make a call because if everything else is in line, and if they've met everything else, there absolutely are waivers that they can use for certain student situations. It, it happens all the time. It really does. So if you say, you know, UConn's where we want to go. She meets everything else. Look at all this other wonderful stuff she's done and, and will do. We just don't have this physics. Could she take it at a college, you know, over the summer? Like, there's there's ways sometimes that they'll work with you to get around it. Um, but I would call the admission office and express your frustration with that, for sure. Any other questions? Yes. So, is there only one essay workshop, or do you do? We just do the one, and then, you know, I love doing essays with my students because I'm a former English teacher, and so, you know, I love to sit down with them and go through ideas and go through the editing process with them, and I know there's a ton of English teachers who do the same, and other counselors do the same, so we have, a, there's a village around them that can help them get through that essay process, absolutely. Sure, yeah. Yep. And I'm here um, usually until 5 o'clock every day. So I, I'm here and available to them if they are after school and want some help. Any other questions or concerns? Okay, you've been lovely. Thank you for spending the evening with us. And have a great night. I'll be up at the front if you need anything. Thank you all.